Shalom Chavrim. I uh, get a chance to come and speak with you. And um, for my Jewish brethren, I pray that you will pay especially close attention. And I realize that some of the things that I'm going to say are very different for you. It's going to be different from the traditional sense that we have learned in Judaism. Uh, but I feel like that the identity of the Messiah is something that although many Christians have tried to debate with our, with our people and to prove that Jesus is Messiah, um, a lot of the things we're, we're familiar with as far as their thoughts and how they try to address the subject. And so therefore, we pretty much have answers for them no matter which way they go. If they go to Isaiah 9, 6, for example, uh, if they go to, I uh, believe, uh, Yeshayahu uh, as well, in, 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 in a, uh, 7, where it speaks about the young maiden, uh, and we defend our, our belief based on the interpretation of words and, and so forth, you know. And so, I'm not going to take you into that particular direction. In fact, uh, last night as I was studying in the Torah, uh, I also picked up the Christian Bible and I, there was something that I remembered that was stated in the Christian Bible, and it's actually in the, uh, in the Apostles' writings, the, uh, the book of John, uh, where he speaks about, in the beginning was the Word. <laughs> and that kind of was special to my own heart because I think about what John says in the beginning, you know, he refers back to the beginning. He's going to Bashit, he's going to Genesis. And uh, so I, I had seen that before, and so I wanted to go back and review that. And somehow or another, I got it mixed up in my mind where this was at, and I ended up in the first epistle of John instead. And as I began to read what was here, I'm like, well, gosh, this is not it. But again, it's speaking of the beginning. So I decided to read on down a little bit more. And I'm thankful of the Lord that I did so because it really blessed my heart. And I want to share this with you. Um, so if you're, if you're my Jewish brother, if you do not have a Christian Bible, um, uh, I encourage you to get one at least for no other purpose just to follow with me on some of these things. Uh, but anyway, it says in this particular chapter, in verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, um, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Now, that which was from the beginning, Notice carefully what this man writes here. Which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Now we can think clearly back in Genesis life. What was life in Genesis? The Chaim, the tree of life. What was the word? First word from God's mouth. The Yomer Elohim Yahyor. So let's just keep that thought in mind. For the life was manifest, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father was manifest unto us. Unbelievable. Hard to believe. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father was manifested unto us. That's a powerful statement. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ and these things write we unto you that, you, that your joy may be full. Verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, 
For the most part, we might argue and say, well, we've heard this before. But I really am going to challenge you today. I'm going to challenge you in a way, brothers, that I don't think you've been challenged before. Before we go, though, to the Torah, I want to take also, though, the one that I was going to read, and that is John 1 and 1. I want to read this one to you as well. Again, this man John, the apostle of Jesus here, Yeshua, he writes in here, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, this is claiming that Yeshua, Jesus, is the one that made all things, and we know clearly in the Torah that God made all things. But notice, though, he says that in the beginning was the Word. So we're going to go back and we're going to find out what the Word was in the beginning. Uh, we know that John said the Word was God, so we need to prove this. Um, let's read a little further, though, what he says. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Notice that word light. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, it's, it's, it stays with the same inspiration here, this light and this word in the beginning and so we have to go back and look then and see exactly what is in the beginning there I got a tree limb or something banging outside my window here with a little storm trying to brew up so if you're hearing all the banging around there that's what that is okay so we, we go to our sheet you get that Aleph. In the beginning, God cre God's creating the heavens and the earth when the earth uh, was astonishingly empty and darkness upon the surface of the deep and divine presence hovered upon the surface of the waters. God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that light was good and God separated between the light and the darkness. God called to the light day and to the darkness he called night. And there was evening and was morning one day. Now, for my brothers that prefer this in Hebrew, we'll read it in Hebrew as well. Bereshit bara v'him et ha-shemayim v'at ha-aretz. V'ha'az ha-tohu v'vohu. Excuse me. V'ha'az ha-yata ha-tohu v'vohu. V'choshik al p'nei t'chum v'ruach elohim ma'achafet al p'nei ha-mayim. V'yomer elohim yahi or. Keep that one tight to your heart. He puts he separates between the light and the darkness. And um now, I want to focus right now as we get into this, and that is the first words from the mouth of Almighty God was, And God said, not just let there be, but eternity being expressed into the world that we live in. The light itself was eternity being expressed. It was God being glorified. That same light is the same light that led our forefathers with Moses when they came out of Egypt. And they were on their way to the promised land and they were led to the desert and the wilderness. It's the same light there. 
That when God said in the beginning, Vayomer Elohim Yahior. And he separates between the darkness and the light. Now, John over here recognizes that in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. Of course it was God. You have to understand what was the light. The light was within him. <laughs> when God speaks something, it manifests into reality. And the first word that God speaks is light. When he says, And so John, he's, you know, he's, not a, he's not a Jew that doesn't have, that's not intelligent. He's a very intelligent brother. He's got a revelation unlike any, more so than even most Christians that I've ever met. The same was in the beginning with God. Of course, the Word was with God. God's Word was in Himself. Isn't it funny when Jesus says, In that day you will know that I am in the Father, the Father in me, and I am you, and you in me? All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Hmm. That's an interesting one. In Him was life. And the light was the light of men. Okay. Now we're going to get into this. Let's move a little further down then. We want to look now at the light of men then. Um, let's go into Belashit uh, Yukadalbet. Uh, beginning with um, Dalit, verse Dalit there. Uh, that's uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4. These are the products of heaven and earth when they were created on the day that Hashem God made earth and heaven. Now all the trees of the field were not yet on the earth, and all the herb of the field had not yet been sprouted, for Hashem God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to work the soil. <laughs> a mist descended from the from the earth, watered the whole surface of the soil, and Hashem God formed man of the dust from the ground, and he blew into his nostrils the soul of life, and man became a living being. Now literally, let's let's look at what he says. Okay. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. But the Chaim is in a plural form. It's not in a singular. And why? Because God created them male and female, created he them. And we know that God later is going to take Eve from him. So God had to breathe more than one life in there. Now notice though, watch this back up. It's kind of like John is giving us a little synopsis of the whole story there. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made. That was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And we wonder why God calls Adam Ish in the beginning. He doesn't call him Adam. Adama from the ground. He doesn't say that. He calls him Ish. I mean, the rabbis know that it's from fire. The word fire, Ish. Out of Yod Shin. But if you take the Yod, which is the first letter of the divine name of God, and take that out, you have Ish, you have fire. But, so what is it? What is the Chaim? The Chaim is, is God's own life. And what is God? He's the light. The human Elohim, Yahior. God is that light. And when God created Adam and Eve and they were in one body, He breathed into His nostrils, Nishmar Chaim. The breath of life. God's own life. And he was Isha, Adam. 
Now, and then it says, And man became a living soul. Now God addressed Adam as an individual. Now you don't see Lenefesh Chayim, but Chaya, because he's addressing Adam as an individual now. For the soul is the life of God. Okay, now, if, if the soul, if God is creating Adam and Eve, and he's breathing into them his life, which we, now it has to be, if, if God breathes Nishma Chaim, what, what's it, where is he breathing this from? We know it's coming from God, but there must be something that identifies God here. Let's look at it. Verse 8. <coughs> Tet. Hashem God planted a garden in Eden to the east and placed there the man whom he had formed. Slechaz, uh, Chet. Verse Chet. And Hashem God caused to sprout from the ground every tree that was pleasing to the sight and good for food. Also the tree of life, Eis Chaim. In the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and bad. And we wonder why in the beginning there was darkness. Hoshech, Nachash, kind of ring a bell, see a similar root in there? Nothing good about the darkness, is there? No, not at all. Only, only the light, only the day is good. The night, no. Nothing good said about it. And yet also we have two trees, one of life and one of knowledge of good and evil. And we find that God breathes in the nostrils of Adam, Nishma Chaim. It was the fruit of the tree of life. It's Chaim. We see this is, is spoken of as a tree, but it's actually God Himself. He is the light. And as, as John says here, uh, in Him was light, and the light was the light of men. It's what, it was our dwelling place, was with God. We were one with Him at that time. There was no uh, division in there. Pardon me, I... Still trying to battle a, 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 a cold here that I haven't fully gotten over. Um, so anyway, let me let me take you though. Let me share with you something though, real quick in Jeremiah. It's something that we need to know. Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah, chapter seventeen. Um, trying to remember where that's at here. Let's see here. You turn with me now to Jeremiah chapter 17. I want to look at this a little bit with you as well. Yod Zayn. You can dial Yod Zayn and go to uh, Yod Bet as far as the verse. Kise kavod ma'rum me'rashon ma'kum mikadeshenu like the throne of glory from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. I mean, God identifies that our sanctuary was in Him. I mean, what do you, do you think John is off on this or what? John is identifying that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. Of course it was with God. Ve'yomer Elohim. Ve'yomer Elohim. Ve'yomer Elohim. And He, God said, let there be light. So the light was inside of God. And then God expresses that light from, e from eternity into a dimension in where Adam and Eve is going to be created and dwell. And He began to brood upon over the face of the deep bringing forth life on the earth. It's not some other God. It's God Himself. No wonder why we have 
Elohim. And I know that many in, in, in different doctrinal views, they have different doctrinal views about who God is. And I know that there are, are, are good people, they have good revelation on who God is, and even in the Christian community, but yet we, but it doesn't take away, we know that there's only one God. And Hashem is that one God. But when it says Elohim, God is able to choose to do and to be whatever He wants to be. And when He decided to show His glory, He showed His glory first in the Shekinah. The pillar of fire. That was at first light. That was God expressing Himself into eternity. Into eternity. And so... You read here, and John is trying to get our attention to understand, in the beginning was the Word. In the first word, I, I remember when I first saw this a, a few months ago, I'm like, well, what was the first word spoken in the Bible? So I went back, to, I said, well, John said in the beginning, so I go back to, to Genesis. And that's when I saw the first time God literally speaks Himself, He says, let there be light. Or, you know, and I always hate saying the word, let there be. So, it's, it's just a crude way of expressing it. Eternity was being expressed from God. That's why it's from God. See, He's from God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word, excuse me, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Of course, because God is... In other words, God has expressed Himself in another way. And through this way that He's expressed Himself as a light, He begins to brood over the earth and begins to create everything that's on the earth. It's not a second person. It's just God Himself finding a way to express Himself in the dimension that we live in. Now, then He says, like here in Jeremiah, like the throne of glory from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. You know, it's the holiness. I mean, look, 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 look I mean, Hebrew it says it right here. Mikadashenu. Kadesh. Holy. From, from, our, from our holiness. <coughs> Adam and Eve had the holiness. And what was the holiness? It was the life, Chaim, that was inside of them. God's own life was inside of Adam and Eve. But somewhere along the way, we had a fall because Eve doubted and she partook of the fruit and death set in. Hmm. And as a result, that way of the then became guarded by God. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. Because I can prove to you, I want to show you these things, but then you're going to also need to understand if this be so, now, John is claiming that he's the light. There's some things that you need to see and understand so you understand how this all goes. Let's go back to the first epistle of John, where he also speaks of this. This which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which we our eyes which have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life, where the life was manifested. Hmm. And we have seen it and bear witness and show you that, he, that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. See, the apostles during Jesus' time had recognized that Christ himself was that word. Now, you might argue, you might differ with that. Let me just show you something though. Remember, now, if God says in Jeremiah 17, like the throne of glory from the beginning, how did God have a throne then? You know, the, the seat of God, the throne of God, where is it? And, the, and what does the scripture say? Um, and, I, and I don't know if I have this marked down yet here. Um, where God actually speaks and says, um, let's see. Hmm. 
And let's find that though real quick. I, I may I may have it here. God speaks about how that the earth is his throne. Um, yes, Isaiah 66, I believe. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? Now heaven, like the throne of thy glory, so heaven, at the throne of God's glory, from the beginning, was when he rested in the Shekinah, the pillar of fire. That is where God's throne is. He was, he was the pillar of fire. And then he says, and earth is my footstool. A body. What is on the earth? Adam was taken from the dust of the earth. <clears throat> no wonder why when God said to Moses and he comes to, the, comes to the burning bush, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. The feet, the significance of, of the feet are represented there because why? Earth is his footstool. God was going to take from the elements of the earth and make a body in which he himself would live in. Through a virgin birth? Okay, I know you guys don't like the word virgin. Okay, so all right, Alma, a young maiden shall conceive, and the child that she would conceive shall be called Emmanuel. Do you not think if Isaiah is going to take the time to make a prophecy like that, it's not going to be a virgin? I mean... Use a little common sense when you're out here debating Christians just because you don't want to believe what they believe. Don't try to come up with Alma. Well, Alma is not a virgin because we're going to use the technicality. She's a young maiden. It should make common sense to us that a virgin conceives because this child is going to have a, a, a child that is going to be called God is with us. And we find that God can be whatever he wants to be. Now you can't say, don't try to say that God cannot be a man because God got into a human body, comes down there before Abraham. Him and two other angels. I know some people try to say Father, Son, Holy Ghost. No, it's not Father, Son, Holy Ghost. God only identifies, or Moses identifies the one that stayed with Abraham as being Hashem. That's what God does. He identifies him. He doesn't identify the other two. Never says it's the Son and the Holy Ghost. No, it's not that. And you'd have a little problem anyway, because the Holy Ghost then is in, in, in even in, in Hebrew here, it is a, it is, never mind. Uh, I don't want to go there. It'd be too deep for you at this point. Let's, let's stay right in with this here. So earth is his footstool. What did Jesus do then? What did the Yeshua do that should have given this away to us? I mean, the signs that he did and the words that he said to us when he was here were evident of who he was. When he took, for example, with Peter and he, and he girded himself right there at the Passover and he goes to wash his feet and he said, Lord, not so, not me. He said, don't do that. He said, you don't know what I'm doing. It was a sign to Israel. The feet, the footstool. Why did Moses command Aaron to wash his hands and his feet? Before coming, before coming to the altar of God to offer sacrifice. Could it have something to do with the piercing of his hands and feet? It's a thought. Thought, thought something. Some of these things we don't think about, do we? Um... I want to share with you something else here. And, and, and keep in mind, another sign of who he was when it comes to the washing of the feet is when the Lord came to Abraham and Abraham fetched the water. And he said, Lord, let me wash your feet. 
Genesis chapter 18. Let me fetch you a kid of the goats there and, and, and make you uh, some meat and, 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 and some bread and hasten up some bread. Very interesting, nonetheless. Um, har hey, uh, excuse me, the, uh, Rahab the harlot, another example. In fact, Rahab had more sense to know who Yeshua was, Jesus, than the religious Jews of our day, of our forefathers' day. She recognized him to be the same one that spoke to Abraham. Now, isn't it funny, though, that Jesus actually says, when they ask him, how old are you? Are you they, say, you know, they say, you're a man over 50 years old, and you say, you've seen Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Sure he was. John identifies him there. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we handled him, and we touched him. The Word of God himself, we handled and touched him. Who were they handling and touching? They were touching Jesus. And they claimed that He was that Word in the beginning. And Rahab recognized it. That's why she took and come and washed His feet. She did like her father Abraham did when God came down in a body of flesh and walked before Abraham. Abraham wanted to do something for him. So the first thing he does is get some water to wash his feet. Why didn't Simon do it? He invites him to the party, but he doesn't recognize that he's God in his midst. Now, brethren, there's a statement that Jesus made. I want to pull that up for you now. And then we're going to talk about the redemption. And, um, and I've said this on tape already, already for some of the people that watch the videotapes out here. Um, and I want to say it to you again. This is found also in John 14, the epistle of John. Jesus saith unto to him, I am the way, the truth, and and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had not, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him, and have seen him. And Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it will suffice us. Jesus said unto him, Have I not? Have I been so long time with you, and yet, and yet, um, you have not known me, Philip. He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how say you then show us the Father? Because why? God himself is the Father himself, Elohim, in the beginning. It was God himself that said, Ve'yomet Elohim Yahiyot. And God, he said, let there be light. That light was with God, it was in God, and it was God. It was God expressing himself, a way for himself to come and have fellowship and dwell with us. That's what God was doing when he said, the Yomed Elohim Yahiyod. All right, now we come down to this point here. Jesus says, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You have to understand, when God made that way to begin with, when God made a way for eternal life for Adam and Eve, He took in the garden, He formed Him from the dust of the ground, and it was Him that breathed in His nostrils. It's the Es Chaim, the tree of life, was God Himself breathing into Adam's nostrils. Nishmar Chaim. The breath of God's own life. The life which was the light of in Genesis, uh, at the beginning of Genesis verse 2, I think that is. <clears throat> Don't have it in front of me right now. But he breathes into their nostrils a breath of light. In other words, so the, what was it? And it was God's life. And God was the light. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to say this slow enough so to sink into you. Because John clearly says that the, that the life was the light of men. 
And how did John know that? Because one, John knows that God himself said, let there be light. God, he knew that that was God materializing in the dimension that we live in. And that materialized God was also the tree of life, Eitz Chaim, which was the word Chaim, Chet Yod, Yod Mim. I think we have two, yeah. Yes, Chet Yod Yod Mim. Um, Get down to where we have that right there, just so you. I don't want. I don't want you to miss this at all. Yes, hit your yod mim. All right. That life is God's own life, and we already know that God expressed Himself as light. So when God puts His life inside of you, it is the light or a portion of the Spirit of God living in you. And that's what Jeremiah just got through saying to you when I read that to you in Jeremiah. Let me pull that back for you again. Jeremiah chapter 17. Like the throne of glory. The throne of glory was the, was the Shekinah, the pillar of fire. From the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. It's where we dwell. It's where we can abide in Him and His holiness is when God is inside of us. And that's the way God did it in the beginning. That's how God did this with Adam and Eve. He breathed in them His own life and His life was the light. See, you see the revelation? I mean, you so down on Christians so many times, but you need to look at what the, what, what the original Jews that saw this had to say. That which was from the beginning, first epistle of John. That's two different ones. I know it's a little confusing. It confuses me sometimes as well. In chapter 1. That, by the way, there's like one, two, and I think three epistles that John wrote that are near the back of the Christian Bible. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. My God, do you guys get that? The very first word that God speaks is light. And that light is life. He's letting you know that the word became his life itself. And they handled that word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show you unto that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and have heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light. They got it. You know, before I even read this, the Lord revealed that one to me. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Why? Wow, he separated that darkness from Himself. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. See, what happens when you read something like that right there, we're thinking of the carnal side of it now. That's what we're doing. But you know what's interesting, though? There's so much truth to that. What, what was the darkness on the earth back then? It was Satan. The serpent, Nachash, he represented that which was evil. Because he didn't separate himself from the darkness. Isn't it interesting how Satan is bound up in everlasting chains of what? Dark, darkness? Oh, wow, that's a... Let me... Everlasting chains. Yes. Jude chapter 1. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. It's not just a metaphor, and yet it is a metaphor. Wow, this is incredible. Incredible, I have to tell you. I mean, I, I am totally blown away by this. Now, um, 
As I said to you a minute ago, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, this is important, and we're going to get into this in just a second here. I remember when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I thought to myself, I, I, know, what he, I know what Jesus means when he says he's the way. And I know what he means when he said he's the life. Because in him, and we're going to get into that, you'll understand why in a minute why he is that life. And I knew he was the way because it was the avenue in which God would use to restore back the eternal life that was lost. We're going to get into that in just a minute. But I couldn't understand how he could be the truth. I mean, I knew that what his words were were truth. And then I found it in the book of Psalms. And so I'm going to take you right now. So just, just to kind of set the stage for you, um, it's important that we do that. In Psalm uh, chapter 119, verse 160, Thy word is true from the beginning. Mm. So yes, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, amen. So I got them all now. So now I know why Jesus actually said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Because David in the psalm bears out that the word was truth. That's it. So praise be to God. Now, my brethren, I'm going to take you through some things here that's going to be a little different. There is a place in the Christian Bible where Jesus meets uh, a woman at, at the well. And that's what I want to take you to. That's over, ironically, in the book of John. seems like John knew all the things more better than anyone else uh, when it comes to these things. Um, Jesus is, he's, 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 his disciples go into town to get some... Get some uh, some food and, and while he's there uh, there's a woman that comes out to get to draw water and uh, and when she does um, she's a Samaritan woman and by the way for, for those of us that don't think that Jesus and I'm not in that category that he's the Messiah it's kind of interesting that we changed our own laws to match what he says right here because you know Jesus said he was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel and the Samaritan woman, he claims to be as a Jew, even though uh, she was not a Jew by her father. She was a Jew by her mother. Because you have to remember, the Samaritans are those Jews that during the Syri uh, Syrian invasion, when they had uh, dispersed the northern tribes of Israel, the ten northern tribes, the Samaritans were the women that were ravished by the Syrian army and uh, brought forth children, and so the Jews didn't want anything to do with them because their mothers were Jews, but not their fathers. So, but when Jesus came along, though, he never, he never excommunicated her from being Jewish at all. Uh, and ironically, because of the Holocaust and all the events that we have here, now the rabbis have also made that statement that, well, you're Jew not because of your father, but because of your mother. You're taking his laws yourself, and you just don't seem to get that. Um, Anyway, so she's coming down there, and, the, uh, and so he said, The woman saith the Samaritan to him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, That thou knewest the gift of God, and whom it is, <clears throat> excuse me, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink. Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Keep that one in mind. Hang on. Living water. God help me not to forget the scripture that's on my heart about that. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. And, you know, where are you going to get the water from? So they go into a little bit of a uh, theological disagreement here. And uh, so Jesus answers to her in verse 13, Whoever, uh, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into uh, everlasting life. Now, the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, come hither. And the woman said, you know, she said she doesn't have a husband. Jesus says you've had five and You've told the truth, and the one you're living with now is not yours. I'm just paraphrasing right now, just trying to get on down into the story here. Uh, verse 21, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. 
But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, this one, my brothers, is going to be a little tough, I know. And there's no doubt about it, I know it will be. He has given the Samaritan woman a sign to watch for. And that's something that you guys have got to realize as well. What is the sign that he's giving her? He's actually, when he, when he talks about that water being in him, flowing, and that he would give her that water that she doesn't have to come here anymore, he's actually referring, in a way, back to the rock itself that Moses smote in the wilderness. Now, the rock that Moses smote also is foreshadowing um, foreshadows the Messiah. That's in Numbers. Now, actually before we got to Numbers, that's the one where God tells him to speak to the rock and then he smites the rock in anger. But 38 years before that, um, God had, commands Moses to get the elders Israel together and um, and he's to go out there. It's in, uh, I believe it's Exodus 12. Let me see. Him. No, not Exodus 17, I think. The Lord said unto Moses, go, go on before the people and take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river. Take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink, and Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Mirabah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted saying, is the Lord among us or not? Have you ever noticed that argument there, is the Lord among us or not? It's the same argument that's going on today. It was, or excuse me, the same argument that was going on in the days when, when Yeshua was here. Is God among us or not? I mean, some people recognize, I mean, they ask Jesus a question, who do, who's, who do they say that I am? And Jesus asked that question, and they say, some say that thou art the, um, what, Elijah or one of the prophets raised from the dead, and he says to Peter, you know, who do you say that I am? He said, thou art the Son of God, the King of Israel that was coming to the world. Um, and then other people would say, this man's a sinner. You know, there was all kinds of different arguments going on out there about who he was. And that's what was going on there. They didn't know if God was among them or not. Now, ironically, the way they knew God was with them was the pillar of fire. But undoubtedly, maybe they didn't see the pillar of fire for a couple of days, so they got into an argument whether or not God was really there or not, and they were thirsting to death on top of it. And so God tells Moses, take the elders of Israel with you and go out there and smite the rock and I'll stand there when you do it. What was God doing by smiting the rock? Do you not realize that God was showing you the way he brought Adam and Eve into existence? Adam was one man. But inside of Adam was his own wife Eve. God had breathed a plural form of God's own life inside of him. Yes, he was a living soul, for his soul was the life of Yahweh. But what about God? But what about Eve? He was called Ish, out of your sheen. And then God saw that it was not good for the man to be alone. Do you not realize something is wrong in the Garden of Eden when God says it's not good? There had to be something wrong. Anytime God says something's not good, something is not good, that's for sure. And it was so bad. No doubt Adam was distraught. Not just lonely, but a lonely to a point to where he didn't know what to do anymore. But yet inside of himself, he knew that Eve was there. He had to have known. It's like when God said, Elohim, Elohim 
inside of God was Christ. Moshiach was inside of him. And when he spoke, the Yomad, Elohim, Yahior, Moshiach become all. Eternity became the Shekinah glory. And in that Shekinah glory that was in the Garden of Eden, all the life of God that ever was, that he was going to pour out upon his children so that we could be in his sanctuary, so that we could live in him, so that the light of God could be in us, was in that Shekinah glory, just spinning into the garden right there. That was the Eitz Chaim. No wonder why when Yeshua was on earth, and he breathed in his own apostles' nostrils, and he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. What was he doing? He was showing that he was that light. And God saw and sees with Adam, he's in, he's in travail, and something is going wrong in Adam. And he says it is not good for the man to be alone. And he caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. You ever wonder why we have to offer blood as a sacrifice? God had blood spill on this earth one time. And it wasn't by death. But he put Adam nearly to a, to a deep sleep. Let me, let, me, let me pull this up for you. Let me just get this for you in the Torah. So you know what I'm telling you. Adam, Levador, we shall know that okay. It's not good for the man to be alone, but let's go to verse 21, Kaf Alef. Chet, Shlim, Chet Alef. And then he says here, Adam, we shall know that you can't be a chad, Mislato. And so God said, cast a deep sleep upon the man and he slept that word there for, for, for what God does here and I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm searching here real quick trying to find that place over here but the word for sleep in Hebrew by the way is the same thing as a coma in this particular word here it's like, a, it's like being in a coma I don't know why in the life of me I've not found that yet. But anyway, well, I'll come back to it here in a minute. But anyway, God, God causes that type of sleep to come upon him. And I know one time someone asked me, they said, well, how can that be that, that there would be blood? I thought this would be a bloodless operation. I said, if it's a bloodless operation, then why do you have to put him into a deep sleep so deep as if he were dead? Because God opened up the flesh. He opened up his side. And it literally says... Minish, from that spirit of God that was in Adam, he takes Isha. Eve is not called Eve. She's not called Chava. She's called Isha. Alav Shin, hey. That's how you spell it. Ish, fire, the first two letters in her name, Alav Shin. The hey, the hey is the second letter in the divine name of God, Ish. And for Adam is out of Yod Sheen, the Yod, the center letter there, is the first letter for the divine name. You have the, you have the word God. Even the rabbis, you know that. And then he closes back up that wound there. And of course, Adam sees her and says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Nowhere do we see anywhere in the word that God has to breathe the breath of life into her. Nowhere. You know why? She already had it. She had to have had it. Because God had put more than one life inside of Adam. More than one light in him. And when he expresses it in her, he calls her by what she is. The feminine. The life of God. Made in a human body. Called Isha. It is only after sin 
comes into the garden. And when the sin comes into the garden, they recognize they're naked. They sow fig leaves. You know, when Adam and Eve were filled with God's glory, you know, they were not naked. Not in the sense that we would think nakedness. They were covered in the Shekinah, in the light of God's holiness. They had no need of clothes because they're they were not seen. They show the picture of Adam and Eve in the garden, you know, naked and they're kind of hiding behind trees and stuff like that. They were clothed in His glory. They did not see each other as what you would have two naked people today. The problem was, when sin came in, they lost that glory. God removed His glory when doubt and unbelief come in, when darkness come in, and they fellowship with the darkness then God's glory had to be removed because darkness and light have no fellowship. God said in the beginning, He put Mavdil uh, between it. He put a separation between the darkness and the light. God separated it. And now what do we have? We have a major, we have a major problem going on now. Major problem. And so God separates between these. But Adam and Eve, they end up being forced out of the garden. And I won't go into that right now as far as that there, but the thing was, was when they were forced out of the garden, I believe it was another dimension that they were in. They were forced into this earth, the rocks, the caverns, the caves, and things that were not the beauty of God's glory and where He is the light of man. But when God saw that His creation had fallen, it grieved Him so much because God had longed for this fellowship. He had longed for this. And the Scripture tells us that when they go out of the garden, that God puts up... Let me just find it here for you. And because when God puts out, he says here in verse 22 in chapter 3, and, and Hashem God said, Behold, man has become like the unique one among us, knowing good and bad. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So Hashem God banished him from the garden to work the soil. And from, he was taken and, and having driven him out, he stationed at the east of the garden of Eden the cherubim, and the flame of the ever-turning sword to guard the way of the tree of life. The east of garden, the garden of Eden. It's kind of interesting because, you know, even Yeshua said that he would come back and he would enter in at the eastern gate. Kind of interesting, nonetheless. The tree of life, which was God's own life, now the problem is, is now the children, now they never lost the ability to bring forth children, but the thing is, is when they begin to bring forth children, there was no more life being breathed into them. They did not receive the eternal life either. And so now sin has come in, and our fathers, even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we have brought forth children upon children upon children upon the earth. And all the way down through the ages there, we bring forth the life, but it doesn't have eternal, our children never had eternal life, and so they go to the grave. But even Job, as he made the mention of this, he said, man, he said, I see a flower, a flower dies, and, and yet it can live again. He said, but what about a man? He said, he wasted the way, and he goes into the ground, and his loved ones come, and, they perceive, and he perceiveth it not. And then he saw, he said, I see my Redeemer, and he liveth. On the last day he shall stand upon this earth, and my eyes shall behold him, and not another. So he knew that he would be resurrected. <clears throat> and the Jews have always believed in the resurrection. Why do we need a resurrection? We need that life. We need, we need what was in the Garden of Eden restored back in us. Now, the thing is, is that way was guarded. The life 
was guarded. The truth was guarded. The way to the tree of life was guarded. Jesus comes along and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I told you in Psalm that the word is the truth. John says that he was that word. So how do we know that he was? He says to that little woman, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink and I would give you water that you don't have to come here anymore. When Moses and the elders took and smote the rock over the argument of whether or not God was even among them, that's what happened 1,500 years later right there in Israel. The rock came along And the argument came up of who is he? We have to consider this. If God had taken and put life in a plural form into Adam's body so that he could impart eternal life for his wife, then God would have to again, if sin has is, is caused the fall, and then it separated us from that tree of life, from God's life, we can't get to, as Jeremiah says, you know, his glory from the beginning is, 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 our, is our sanctuary. We can't seem to get back to our own sanctuary, the holiness of God, because something has been blocking us. God has got them to make another Adam. We look for Mashiach. Now, all we think about when we think about Mashiach, well, Mashiach is supposed to come and there's going to be peace on earth. I'll do a, I'm going to have to do a separate video on that. I mean, but come on. Daniel plainly says, we're, we're gonna, let me, we got to read this just for a second because, you know, uh, brothers, don't, don't keep going with that one. I mean, that's really just not smart on our own part. Uh, Daniel 9. You got to keep in mind, even, even Jesus himself knew. He prophesied of his own death. He prophesied of the destruction of the second temple. We talk about a third temple. Well, the second temple was still there. Who thought it was going to be torn down? Okay? He prophesied there won't be one stone left upon another. He prophesied of the destruction of his body in three days. He said, I'll raise it up. And he didn't say somebody else would raise him up. He said, I'll raise it up. Okay? But let's see what Daniel says about him. Now therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince shall be seven, seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So the second temple was to be destroyed. The second temple now, not the third temple. After the Messiah comes. So, because when Daniel prophesies this, Second Temple hasn't been destroyed yet. And he even talks about when it would be built. It would be built in troublous some times. Again in the wall. See, notice too, the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous some times. He's not just talking about the temple, he's talking about the walls of the city. That was with Nehemiah. When he goes back, when Artaxerxes gives the, gives the command to go back and rebuild the, the streets and the walls. And we know that there were three decrees that went forward. Artaxerxes and, uh, excuse me, um, Artaxerxes and, uh, I forget the names of the other ones off the top of my head. We won't go into that right now then. But, but anyway, they go back to rebuild. So the temple, the second temple had to be built. And it was after the second temple, the Messiah is going to come. But he's going to be cut off before. See? And after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Hmm. And of course, Jerusalem was destroyed. So Messiah, and, and this is in the Talmud too, so I don't say it's not. It's written in the Talmud that, you know, that the Messiah was supposed to come and, and be cut off before that. So... 
And it's kind of ironic because Jesus picks up the scrolls and he reads Yeshayahu, Isaiah 61, and he reads only the verse that applies to when he came, but he doesn't read the second half of verse 2, which brings the judgment that he comes, because we know he's supposed to rule with a rod of iron. The rod of iron ruling has not come as of yet. Um, so, you know, and it's all written in the, in, in the Christian Bible. It's not anything new that we shouldn't already know. But the thing is, though, he gives a woman at the well. Let me get back to that. He gives a woman at the well a sign to look for the water. The waters of life is what he's given her to look for. And as Moses, when he smote that rock and the water came forth, that water represented, and that rock represented how God had taken Adam and Eve. And when he split Adam open, he took that life out of Adam in order to make Eve the waters of life. And of course, the rock was typing what was going to happen to Yeshua. In order, if God was bringing forth eternal life, he breathes it into the nostrils of Adam. And then when he makes Eve, he separates Eve from him. He doesn't have to breathe in her nostrils. Why? Because she's already got the Holy Ghost. She had it when she was inside her husband. See, what is the fruit of the tree of life? It's life. So the tree becomes tangible upon the earth. Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. He becomes the footstool. He becomes in feet walking on the earth. <laughs> and when he was up on Calvary and his side was ripped open, what came from his side? Blood and water, but they were separated. It showed so many things when that happened. One, I believe the Samaritan woman was there that day. I believe she saw it. And when she saw that water come forth, she knew then that inside of him was the waters of life. Moses was giving us a sign. I've got this written down, in fact, somewhere here. Let me see if I can find it real quick for you. Um, I sure do. Oh, gosh. But he was the waters of life. It may, may be water. Let me just try to find this here. Yeah. This one's action, Revelation, and he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life. There's one in the Torah, the Tanakh as well, and I can't recall exactly where that's at, but I need to find that for you. I'll try to find it in a little bit here. I found it just before I started to do this video. But see, the thing is, is when his side was opened up, that water of life came out of him. It was showing that he was the second Adam. It was showing that the life that was in the Garden of Eden, the tree of life, was inside of him. And that water represented the Holy Spirit being poured out. No wonder why when he resurrected and he took and he breathed upon his apostles and he said, Receive you the Holy Ghost. He was showing the, the disciples that he was the one in the Garden of Eden that breathed into Adam's nostrils. And on the, at the 120 in the upper room, what did they do? They all received the Holy Ghost. Now, we might would say then, where is the type then of Eve then? Where is the type of the one that can receive the Holy Ghost without having it breathed upon him? It was John the Baptist. Did he not come forth from his mother's womb filled with the Holy Ghost? He was a type of Eve. He's a type of the bride. And see what we have need of, my brothers, we have need of that life from the Garden of Eden, the Tree of Life, which is God's own Shekinah glory, His light. We have need of that to live in us. And, and the scripture when it says, you must be born again, that's what that being born again is all about. See, the flesh birth will die. This human body will just go to the dust and die. But if you receive His life, if we receive, if we let Him breathe upon us the spirit of life, 
the Garden of Eden, that light that was there, He can breathe that upon us. He came forth in a human body. He became sin. He became the sacrifice for sin. Why did He have to shed His blood? Because in order to bring forth life the first time on the earth, God opened up Adam's side and blood was poured on the ground. And the only way to bring forth that life again would be to shed the blood again and open His side up and let the life that was in Christ come out and come back upon us. God had to become a man in order to fulfill His Word. And He had to do it without sin. Why without sin? Because sin is what cut it off. He could have no fellowship with darkness. There's no life in darkness. He had to come and live a life without sin. And he had to walk in a world of darkness to do it. And he had to keep himself separated from the sin in order for this to happen. And we throw our nose up to the only thing that will save us is that eternal life. You've got to recognize what he did for you. What he did for me. And so when he says, like when he said to Nicodemus, you know, you must be born again. No man can see the kingdom of God unless he be born again. And Nicodemus was puzzled. He said, how can this be? Shall I enter my mother's womb the second time? He wasn't talking about the flesh. Adam, when he was made a flesh body, laid there as a clay figure on the ground and everything until God breathed in his nostrils a breath of life. And then we wonder why. Why, why, what, what is the sacrifices going to do us? We build the third temple, we offer the sacrifices, what good is it going to do us? Can the life of the animal come back upon us? No. But we need that life. That life was to only represent what he was going to do. When we offer up the, the, the goat and we let the other one loose out in the wilderness, what are we doing that for? Because Jesus was both scapegoat and the goat, just like Joseph. Joseph was the scapegoat, the goat that was sacrificed by his brothers and poured on his coat and sent back to his father to identify was a sacrificial goat. That's where Moses got the law from. That's where God gave it to him from. And Yeshua was the same way. The only thing is with him, he played both. When they took Joseph's coat back to his father and said, identify this, is this your son's coat or no? Yes, it is. What had become of him? In the case of Jesus, so he was the sacrifice. He gave his life, his blood for us. And he was a scapegoat. He took our iniquities. What iniquities? He took the iniquity of our forefathers that said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And he buried it very far away. So therefore, that our kindred that have come down to the last 2,000 years and never recognized Yeshua to be Mashiach would not be lost. The same with, with Joseph's brothers. Had God not recognized the sacrifice of that goat that they cut his throat and poured that blood upon his brother's coat and went back and deceivingly lied to their father, if God didn't accept that as an atonement for their sin, we would be ten less tribes today, brother. But God accepted that sacrifice. And that's why we still have 12 tribes. And one final note for you, and that is, with Yeshua, when we cried out, let his blood be upon us and upon our children, we meant it for evil, just like Joseph's brethren did. But God accepted that blood that day when he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He accepted that as an atonement for us. Also, kind of like Benjamin, you remember when they finally go down into Egypt, Joseph and his, or excuse me, Joseph's brothers and Joseph's, of course, exalted to the right hand of Pharaoh. They kept getting their money put back in their sack. So you can't buy it. We can't pay for it. It's already paid for. But that's also a type of how that Joseph and Jesus both were sold out. That happened twice. Remember that? Jo Jacob sent back double the money to pay for it. Said so maybe it's an oversight. After on the second time though, they <clears throat> he put his cup in Benjamin's bag, 
in his cup, by the way, represents Christ, Yeshua, Mashiach, being rejected at the communion table. Are we going to continually to reject him, or are we going to wake up and recognize that he is the Messiah? We need to do something. We need to recognize what God has done for us. I pray this is a blessing for you. Those of you that are that out there that may hear this on YouTube, I thank God for you. And I want to ask you a specific favor tonight. Take this video and every site you can find to publish it on, publish it there. Every place you can put a link at, put it at. When you go in, go into Jews for Jesus. They may need to hear it as well. Go to Jews for Judaism. You have people like Rabbi Tobias Singer. You have Rabbi uh, Yisrael um, Blumenthal. You have Rabbi uh, Eli Cohen. Uh, you have Rabbi Winston. You have Rabbi Mizrahi. Many of these different rabbis that are out there that they don't see who Jesus is. They don't recognize him to be Messiah. And I don't hold that against them because I recognize that even Jesus said, until the dispensation of the Gentiles be fulfilled, see, that the Gentiles were trodden down the holy place there in Israel. So, but the thing is, is maybe it'll begin to start to make sense and maybe it will help them. And again, we covet your prayers, we covet, covet your help, if you can help us in any way to get this message out to wherever we go um, in the time that it takes to do these. Uh, pray for us, we'll be praying for you. And uh, I know there's many of you that have tried to contact me recently and have not been able to get back with you. I'm trying to spend that time in prayer and to see what God wants me to do each, each and every day here. Um, and it's really getting a little bit tough because even with our, our, my regular job, I've kind of let that go by the wayside, trying to do this full time. Uh, and it's made it very tough and put a burden here on our family. So, uh, But I, I just ask you to pray for us. We do covet your prayers. God bless you.